giving greater honor to the parts that it lacked, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. All believers are therefore part of one body, one unit, one team. And we have no choice but to work together as such. But are we all team players here as believers here on earth? Or would we rather be like the eye that says to the hand, I don't need you. Let's not forget, I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. Let us bow heads. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Folks, we live in perilous times. We know we just have to look at the news any day. And the stories keep getting more and more horrific. Yet still, in a time when we have access to more information and interconnectedness with people all across the globe, no matter what is going on in the world, we sometimes seem to manage to build our own bubbles, unaffected by the external conflicts and turmoils of this world. Some people sitting here may not even know that there was a massive hurricane, Milton, destined to devastate Florida just a few days ago. Others don't know about a child that was bullied and ultimately took his own life in escape. Some don't know that Guyana tried to and successfully stole a CPL title away from the Trinidad Knight Riders. Sometimes it's only when troubles reach our doorstep or in our church or in our families that we look to face it and not bury our heads in the sand. Whatever conflicts, trials and tribulations we are experiencing in our lives, in our churches, in our country or that exists out there in the world what is our response as Christians? Well, it's very simple. There is nothing new under the sun. And the Bible continues to show its wisdom and relevance even to this day. So let us join in a pilgrimage of unity as a church to face these external and internal challenges. You see, the Bible explains to us that Christian unity is a state of oneness, harmony, and love amongst believers. We, as believers in Christ, frustrating as it might be to deal with our fellow humans and their egos, sensitivities, and prejudices, we are called to commune with one another. You see, a church, as we know it now, is a creation of ours. It is where we come together as a team with one common focus to unite in prayers, worship, and to do the works that advance God's kingdom here on earth. None of us, no matter how much we think we're talented, how wealthy we are, or what we do in church, what position we hold, 
we need to come together and unite as people of God. We see it all the time, and frankly, more and more, we see the need to work together. This church itself, Armalaya Presbyterian, is a great example. Many ideas, many hands, many meetings, many benefactors, and many people share their talents to make this church what it is today. It may have started over those years with Reverend John Morton, but it was only brought to fruition by the other missionaries and the other persons, catechists and locals who sustained it, developed it, so that it evolved into what we can be proud of today. Morton was just one of a team of missionaries that had come to do what we now proudly proclaim and preserve and sustain as our Presbyterian legacy and heritage. It was not one person. And so in the same way, in our country, it is no president, prime minister, minister, no priest, no pundit, no imam, who can do it on their own, what is needed. We can praise leaders or condemn them as much as we want. They cannot do anything without a band of committed followers. Jesus was no different. His work here on earth would have been nothing were it not for the disciples and the early evangelists that spread this message throughout the world so that it could reach right here in Tunapu. I am delighted that the Board of Men chose to illustrate this message by giving a football analogy. The, breast, the dressing room of a football club was being addressed by their football coach as they were losing at halftime. He didn't like what he was seeing with his team on the field. They did not seem united and as if they were playing as a unit. Unity, he explained, was the collective strength of all 11 players on the pitch. Some players may be performing well, but it was required that the collective team work was there to give them the victory. He took a pencil and he broke it and demonstrated the weakness of this one individual who was outshining all the rest. He then gathered 11 pencils and tried to break it and he could not. Never mind, he used all his force. This was the example that demonstrated the power and strength of a team working together. Right now, one of the world's most famous football clubs, ironically named Manchester United, stands 14th on the Premier League table. Despite being named United for short, I am delighted as a Chelsea fan to say that they're going through a bit of a rough spell. And they have been going through that much longer than we have been going through ours. I can say now we are fourth in the table at this time. Anyone looking on, however, at Manchester United and knowing the great history of that club, many of us followed them very closely when Dwight York, our countryman, was playing and excelling there. We'll feel a little bit sad when they look at how this team is performing on the field. It is very clear, weekly, that there is disunity amongst the players. There are backroom squabbles, there are players opposing each other publicly sometimes. And yes, recently, calling for the firing of the manager. It is a group of individuals, very expensive individuals 
who are not even trusting of each other's strengths and seeking individual glory. Many of them have their eye on the next prize in the next club or just solely doing this for the money. Is that our church sometimes? Is it just like the church in Corinth that Paul wrote to saying that he heard that something was wrong and they had lost their way? Are the followers of Christ in biblical times that much different to the church in modern times? Are we as reformed Christians not generally on the decline and grasping at the successes of individual churches or people? Don't we sometimes squabble amongst ourselves and take only pride in those few leaders who we admire? Are we ourselves as followers of Christ, not in moral decline, degrading the values which we may have learned, which we may have inherited from our ancestors, and surrendering our moral authority and influence on the society, burying our heads in the sun. Are we failing as a people? Spend the time to ensure that justice and peace and love of Jesus Christ is not shared with our fellow men. I could tell you some of the most frequent things I hear in our church are the statistics of how many scholarships we get this year. academic excellence our schools have done, our primary schools, how many of them passed for their first choice? What buildings or projects we're undertaking? These are the metrics by which we have started to measure our wins. And maybe that's why in the table of life we are way down. Maybe it is how many traditions we can upkeep annually that we are measuring our success. Or maybe we're like the Manchester United owners and measuring whether we meet allocation or we're doing well financially. I know as chairman of my church how important it is that we manage the cockles responsibly, that we seek to try to bring people out to church because we cannot do the work that we have to without certain material resources. And that is why you as a church congregation, as members of this team, elect certain people to your local boards to see about the business end of things. But don't hate them for doing their role in God's body. But what are the other aspects of Christian life that we can help with? What is interesting I should observe about this phenomenon with Manchester United not prospering is that even the most die-hard supporters now are ashamed to wear that shirt outside. They used to be all over Facebook and Twitter rejoicing when they give another team a good lashing. But now they're not really proudly identifying themselves. Is that also true of our team? Are we proudly identifying ourselves as Presbyterian here in Trinidad? And how long ago did we start seeing the downturn in people identifying themselves as members of the PCTT. When did we start to see views for the church chairs? 
being filled less and less, the groups with less young people, our activities not really as well participated. And what did we do about it? Bringing your child to Sunday school might be well appreciated. But knowing that we have a lovely thing going here that the children benefit when they go to Sunday school, have we sought to bring our neighbor's child? Have we sought to bring our niece or nephew or someone else that we know might be spending all day at home on a Sunday? Playing video games or maybe even watching football? How many times are our children too busy playing lessons? Sorry, going to lessons. And we say, well, they have a big exam coming up. We can't, they can't afford the time to come to church or to go to youth group. How are we saving this church? You see, nothing unites a people like learning about God. God is the person, is the being, is the spirit that will change our natures if true unity is to exist amongst us. Of the messengers of God who came to teach about the nature of God, scripture tells us that Jesus lived in a manner that showed no person any different behavior or prejudice. He helped lepers. He blessed the prostitutes. He accepted the tax collectors, the most hated people and disgraced at the time. Ephesians 2 tells us, it is Christ himself who has brought peace between the Jews and Gentiles. He brought those two groups together to be one group. He has destroyed the things that made them separate. When his body died on the cross, Jesus took away the power of the Jewish laws and rules. In that way, he made the two groups join together as one new group of people. As a result, there was peace. How badly does Jerusalem need that peace now? How badly does the Jewish people need to hear that those laws were broken, whether they believe in Christ or not? And that peace and hatred should not reign in our lands, particularly in the Holy Land. You see, Christ did that for us by his death on the cross. And although we as Christians ourselves are split into many different denominations and local churches, yet still we don't focus too much on the different aspects of our differences. You see, there are different styles of worship in different denominations. There are different emphasis placed on different beliefs. Each church you go into has a different characteristic. Even in, even in our Presbyterian church, there's beautiful, beautiful diversity. What we have in common is our belief in Jesus Christ and in the supremacy of the Word of God as our guiding principle for understanding and for leading us to an understanding of God. Jesus, however, is not just believed in by Christians. And that in itself is such a powerful thing. When faced with evil forces, the name of Jesus banishes that. And many Hindus will tell you the same. 
many religions in our population, very diverse population, recognize Jesus. Hindus venerate him as a sadhu or a teacher, some other sects as an avatar or an incarnation of God. In many ways, what we believe as well is that our religion, religion is based on his teachings and that he is an incarnation of God, the Son. Similarly, in Islam, which uses the same Abrahamic, monotheistic belief in God, they revere the teachings of Jesus Christ and respect him as a prophet. You will never hear a Muslim ill speak to Jesus. Albeit they have formed their religious practices based on the preaching of their own prophet. You see, whether you call Jesus Yeshua, Emmanuel, Lamb of God, True Vine, King of Israel, it is still a unifying force. In our local church, why must we seek and foster unity? Why must we preach unity today? Why must we, as the Board of Men, encourage us to take a pilgrimage for unity in particular? It is very simple. It is in our national school prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. Wherever there is hatred, we must bring love. That applies in every religion, in every sphere of conflict, in every family. And that church is also a family of believers. And just like in any other family, mere human emotions will arise. Differences of opinion, passions, hatred comes out in those moments. And sometimes even in church, hatred shows. Being involved, however, in dispute resolution as a career, I can tell you, being part of this church, that many times I hear people say, boy, this church needs Jesus. Or you see, you, you need Jesus there. And they say it almost as if it's a curse. But folks, nothing is wrong with that. Because I need Jesus. And you need Jesus just as much. We are all humans. And we all have shortcomings. We all have weak moments. And even when we see the worst of our Christian brethren, Maybe up on a meeting in Paradise Hill or right here in your local boards. The key is to stay calm and speak the truth of Christ. Sometimes let the heat of the moment pass and stay positive, knowing we are in you with the grace and love of God. The next step, ironically, after the most heated confrontation, is that the Holy Spirit shines through to guide our path and eventually to make the right decision. So we must never give that positive outlook up. Whether it be through purposeful prayer or just allowing our collective hearts and minds filled with God's grace to impede any selfish motives Unity happens here when we as believers join together. So whether you're supporting a football team or you're on God's team, we need to foster and prioritize unity. The oneness of humanity under God. Remembering that we all drink from one spirit, 
And when we were baptized, we were all joined to be in one body. With our many characteristics, talents, strengths, weaknesses, and failures. Many times, nothing puts a sermon and a theme in perspective as good as the closing hymn. And the words of the hymn that will close us this morning, later on, is Christ you call us all to service. All of us. Not to elect on the local board, not the elders alone. All of us. Plant in us a deep commitment. Fire in us a passion for justice. Kindle, us, a, kindle in us a joy for peace. Help us heal the brokenhearted. Teach us to work together. The theme is a pilgrimage of unity because it does not just start and end here with this sermon, folks. Brothers and sisters, the journey only starts here today. If you are not already ready, to take on this challenge, that closing thing should be a clarion call to commit to a life of service, spreading and propagating peace, love, and truth, just as Jesus did when he walked this day. Let us not be afraid, therefore, to, or be too shy to work together with one another, overcoming all the obstacles in our way together. In unity. In the name of our Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ, you will call us all to service, call us all who follow you. Plant in us a deep commitment, all your work and will to do. Fire a passion for your justice, in us kindle love of peace. Help us heal the broken hearted, to the captive bring release. Teach us how to work together, brothers, sisters, side by side. Equal partners in the struggle, in the cause of truth alive. To each one, some gift is given, man or woman, young or old. Help us use each skill and talent, your great purpose to unfold. Let us be a servant people, reconciling, ending strife, seeking ways more just of sharing and of ordering human life. Fill us with a glowing vision of this world as it should be. Send us forth to change that vision into blessed reality.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace both now and forevermore.